I'm Norm Christensen, Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Founding Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment. My name is Dan Richter, Professor of Soils at Duke in the Nicholas School of the Environment. I came to Duke as a graduate student in the 70s, 1970s, late 70s, and quickly fell in love with the Duke Forest. My name is Richard May, and I came to Duke last year. My teaching and research focuses on uh, forest finance and forest carbon. Arthur Sperry Peirce, the chair of the biology department back in the 1920s, played such a critical role in the development of the School of Forestry. He was instrumental in convincing the university that it ought to take this land that it owned and create a research and teaching laboratory called the Duke Forest. In 1938, he was instrumental in recruiting the first dean of the School of Forestry, Clarence Korshu, who really set the tone for what Duke would be doing, particularly in the area of forest ecology, for up, up to, the, to the present. When Horstian got here in the 1930s, the Duke Forest must have been a very different place. Uh, Southern Piedmont was a, an important region for the early economy of the young United States, by which time the soils were extremely erodible. So the environmental history of the Piedmont is one of extensive and, and very intensive erosional loss. And Korshian's task was to get trees to regrow on that. Korshian saw that this would be a great laboratory for planting and encouraging the regrowth of forests across the Piedmont. They put plots in the ground and then they would revisit the plots every five or ten years and that went on for a number of decades. Then in the 1970s the young Norm Christensen came one of the things that really attracted me to come to Duke was having 7,000 acres of forest right at your doorstep. Being out in the forest, uh, when I first came, there were trees that had paint on them and numbers. There were metal stakes, rusted metal stakes everywhere, that folks didn't really seem to know what they connected to. I got a call from the then Dean of the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, uh, Benjamin Jane. And Ben said, you know, we're, we're working in a closet here. There's a, there are a couple of filing cabinets that are just loaded with, with and we, we don't have the faintest idea what these are about, but you come take a look at them. And so I, I did and realized quickly that all those numbers that I was seeing out on the forest corresponded to data sheets for those trees, there, were, there was all of the metadata about how plots were established. And with a couple of colleagues, he started to reinstitute those plots and kept them going. And we've remeasured them all the way to present. And there we have direct observations, which is, uh, to me as a scientist, a lot more meaningful than even the most sophisticated models. We can model, and it's a very important part of science, but, but having physical, tangible observations of change through time uh, does a lot more for me as a scientist. All of a sudden, the Duke Forest gave us a longitudinal study in the ability to look through things through time. Korshin came here with the idea that you could apply principles of ecology to forestry to develop a silviculture for southern forests, which did not exist in the early 1930s. In the past, the Nicholas School has spent a fair amount of efforts looking at Duke Forest from the silviculture perspective. But nowadays, I think it's a good time to combine uh, ecosystem services and products like forest carbon into the consideration. When we talk about ecosystem services, those are public goods, meaning that it's not a single landowner, but the whole society who benefit from uh, biodiversity or from carbon sequestration. Forests can quite rapidly, over years to decades, accumulate tremendous amounts of carbon. Right now, global warming is a key concern for the whole society, 
and Boris Carbon is a nature-based solution. We are looking at uh, a way to sustainably manage forest land so that we can capture more carbon in the forests and this would be an important step toward mitigating global warming and climate change. To quantify the carbon in the trees, we can see these objects. We can put a, a diameter tape around them. We can measure their heights either on the ground or with sophisticated new technologies like LIDAR. Students need to learn something about biology, ecology, to understand the growth and the yield function of forests. On the other hand, they need to understand the market, the benefit, the costs. That's the economics. And this is truly an interdisciplinary discipline. No doubt, forest is a renewable resources, and uh, we need to think about uh, meeting the current need without compromising the needs of future generations. The vision that Clarence Caution had when he came in, he could not have imagined the questions that we would have asked using his data. But we were able to take those same data and uh, do all kinds of other things with them. All of this has truly added to the importance of Duke Forest through time. But none of this could have happened without the historic data. My personal connection to the Duke Forest is so strong. It has its origins in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, part of the Nicholas School, yes. But it really is Duke University's resource. It really goes beyond those, those boundaries. Our skills that we developed in the, in the forest are easily transferable to the city environment. And I had a student Anna Wade, she and I came up with the idea that we should map the soils of Durham. We mapped um, city lead contamination, which we found was, was very high in, in uh, three city parks. That's got me really interested in remediation, so it's an amazing uh, new research for us. I'm excited about Nicholas School. This is a truly inter disciplinary environment in which uh, I can work with colleagues, students from all other disciplines with some mutual interests. And uh, this way I feel that the real freedom of conducting research and uh, I really appreciate that. <laughs>